Hello, everyone out there in podcast world. Hope you're having a wonderful day. You are listening to the Service Business Mastery Podcast. I'm your host, Church Blissett. Today's episode, we're talking to Brendan Kane. Uh, you may have seen uh, a few of his books out. I have a uh, hook point here, and I love it. I listened to it. I've read it, and um, it's really cool about uh, just how to stand out in a three-second world when it comes to social media and and just connecting with your your followers and your potential clients. But with that being said, welcome to the show, Brendan. Thanks so for thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to connect with you and everybody that's uh, watching or listening to this. So tell us a little bit about um, Hook Point and kind of where it came from and your background in general. It's a great question because like Hook Point came out of having to really look back on the past fifteen years of business and understand what I'm really good at more for myself than anything is like really, you know, dial in, like, what do I want to do with my life? I've done so many things in, in career and it's like, where do I provide the most value? And a lot of people know me from my first book around uh, 1 million followers, you know, how I built a massive social audience in 30 days. And I kind of got labeled as the social media guy, but I just look back at my experience and it's like, I do so much more for companies and brands and clients than just like generating followers and social media, which we're good at, but I, I feel like the, there was something missing or there was something missing from the overarching story. So when I kind of looked back at all the things and, you know, how I started, I, I went to film school, um, to, to want to be a film producer. And I was, hoping that when I go to film school, they'll teach you about business. And when I showed up, I quickly realized they don't teach you anything about business in film school. So I figured the best way to really learn about business is start your own. So I started a few internet companies while I was going to college because it was the most cost efficient way. Mm -hmm. And then when I moved to Los Angeles in 2005 to pursue a career in film, it's when the entertainment industry started reawaken to digital after the dot-com bust. Mm. So when I showed up, I started like everybody else at the bottom making coffee and copies and deliveries. And I'm sure you've heard like the entertainment industry is one of the most competitive and cutthroat industries. So oh, yeah. when I was this assistant, people would ask me, well, what do you want to do? And, or why are you in LA? And I would say, well, I want to be a film producer. And I could just see everybody's eyes glaze over because I was just one of a million other people moving to LA to pursue the same thing. Uh -huh. So I needed, I knew I needed to find a way to stand out and a hook point of what I call it now. And I just took a step, step back and I would listen to the conversations happening in the studio. And what I realized is there was a sense of anxiety and panic that would come over the office when we finished a movie because we spent tens of millions, in some cases, hundreds of millions of dollars on a single piece of content. And now we need hundreds of millions of people around the world to know about it in just a few short months mm -hmm. to just have any chance of making sure we don't lose money. Yeah. Uh, so with that, I just, you know, started kind of saying, Hey, listen, I started these internet, internet companies in college. I know how to tap into these traffic sources through websites, blogs, and then social media was just starting. Cause remember this was back in 2005, yeah. you know, I would love to help you because there's very cost efficient ways and often free ways that we can scale your message. Would that be helpful? And they said, yes. So that was kind of the first iteration of the hook point that I created for myself to get my foot in the door and go from making coffee to creating a digital division for the first studio I worked for. And then from there, I just kind of kept going. I got bored with the, the movie industry because people think it's such a sexy and creative thing, but it's just another corporation. Right. And I'm of the mindset that I love to do things um, and create things rather than spending time asking permission to do them. So I left and I started building my own technology platforms and licensing them back to big media companies. So I had to go into the room with a Yahoo, a Facebook, a MTV, a Viacom, or even like celebrities like a Taylor Swift and express the value or the hook to first get the meeting, but then hold that attention and lead to a potential deal. So that's kind of where this concept of hook points started out and where I had to actually just, I had to get good at it. Otherwise I was going to be stuck making coffee for years and years and waiting to work my way up the ladder. And as an entrepreneur yourself, you know, that's just not kind of worth it for us. <laughs> yeah. A hundred percent. So could you share a little bit about the, like how you came into the room with Taylor Swift and how that um, it's in your book. And, and I, I love how you kind of laid it out there, uh, how she wants to interact with, or how she wanted to be able to work 
and kind of persuade that, convey that um, message and be able to change it constantly and how you went in and ha actually had a conversation with them. Uh, can you, can you share that story? Absolutely. And it's, and it's kind of a longer process than people would think yeah. because uh, the introduction came through MTV. So I initially um, got to MTV and structured uh, licensing partnerships with them with technologies, two technologies I built. Hmm. And uh, early on in the process, the executive at MTV is like, hey, do you want to go meet this, this girl, Taylor Swift? She's going to be a big star. I think she's right for your technology. And at the time, she wasn't a huge star. Like she was on the inflection because the first time I ever met her and her manager was backstage um, at a uh, Grammy's like rehearsal or something. So she was on her way, but she's not, she wasn't the, the, the key global superstar there. Mm -hmm. um, and you, some people may be saying, well, how did you get a meeting with MTV or how did you get a deal? <laughs> right. That started with, you know, working in the movie industry. And I made a connection while I was working at one studio with another woman that worked at Paramount. And she brought me to Viacom and MTV uh, through that. But once um, I said, okay, yeah, let's meet with her because I'm down to meet anybody that, you know, this person was recommending because he's a really trusted source. Then it's a series of processes with big name brands or celebrities. So uh, the first meeting was with the manager, which as I mentioned, was like at this rehearsal backstage of the Grammys, Taylor came in for like, maybe like a minute singing or something and was like just a general introduction. But the whole focus of the meeting was just on the manager. And I knew that I didn't want to get distracted trying to grab Taylor's attention or anything, because what I had to do first was I had to understand how the manager perceived the business, what the manager perceived as their challenges were the goals so that I could then articulate our technology to fulfill whatever he um, whatever he saw as their challenges and also the, the opportunity. Mm -hmm. So after that, then he's like, okay, this sounds good, but you need to go talk to Taylor's dad. So then same process had to do with Taylor's dad. Then it became, I had to then talk to Taylor's mom to mm -hmm. get her buy-in because her parents were very involved in her career early on. And, and then it became the meeting with Taylor. And again, by that time I was collecting information from each of the people, the manager, the father, the mother, and even MTV of like how Taylor, Taylor perceived the world, you know, what she loved, what she didn't like, and all of those things. And then I would use that information in the meeting. Now, again, in any of these meetings I'll go in, I still have to read body language, tone, um, responses, because you may get all this information about a person, but then you show up right. and their personality is completely different because they just came from a horrible meeting or they're on the top of the world and everything's exciting to them. Right. Uh, so when, when I went into that meeting with Taylor, I, I took away some key points from, from the other meetings I had is one, she really liked to have hands on control with her brand because she built her fan base herself. She built it one by one and she's the genius behind her success. She didn't have a huge record label or millions of dollars in marketing budget when she first started out. It was her ability to tap into social media, foster these one-to-one -one connections with fans, turn them into brand advocates. And because it was happening in the time where social media was emerging, these brand advocates were now sharing with thousands or tens of thousands of people. So that was one key takeaway. The other key takeaway was the whole team was frustrated with the fact that at the, her official site at the time was an all flash site would take 48 hours to update. The bounce rate off the homepage was like 96%. It just wasn't fulfilling the goals that they were looking wow. for. Um, and the technology that we ultimately did the deal around was uh, it was a application that could dynamically write code for you. So you could drag and drop anything onto the screen and our system would write the code for you. So this was really prior to like Squarespace and Wix and it was more yeah. of an enterprise level. Mm -hmm. So what we did for Taylor, just to show her the power of this, we literally built her an entirely new site in less than six hours. And then when we walked into the meeting, I just said, hey, here's the mouse. You can change any element. You can change the navigation. We can change the entire background of the site all within like two clicks, mm -hmm. no code or anything. So that's kind of like the key points. And the meeting with, with I think the first meeting was like over an hour, like there's multiple aspects, but those were the key things that I really um, dialed into is one control, because I knew she and her team wanted that of this official site and two, the creative expression and the ability 
for this technology to foster stronger relationships with her fans and these brand advocates that meant so much to her. And then even after that, we had to go through another meeting with her agents and the whole, it was like a team of like 10 people at an agency. Wow. So when you're doing deals of that size, I'm not going to say every time it's like that, mm -hmm. but it, it's a lengthy process. Like, M, like doing deals with MTV it takes six months minimum to get done, to go through all the paperwork and, and all of that. So yeah, that's just kind of a little background of, so, of those so meetings. Tell me you mentioned a couple of times that even here now that you need to, you need to fill out the room and you needed to, uh, uh, make sure that you could pivot anytime on any conversation. Whenever we're going in and presenting stuff to clients, you know, most of our listeners here are going to be service business owners. So plumbers, electricians, and, and stuff like that. In your opinion, should we get a, 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 like a template that we just, it's always the same every single time. Or we're going to be more successful if we actually draw it out in front of them. Uh, what, which way are you leaning there? I mean, uh, yeah, it's a great, that's a great question. And in, in my experience, my opinion is, and I've done both sides of it. Yeah. I've gone into meetings with a, a demo, a pitch deck, a presentation already planned out, and you just go dive directly into it. Mm -hmm. And can you be successful with it? Sure but you can also shoot yourself in the foot with it. Uh, and we've seen this with, you know, major deals that we're going after. If we're going after like a Disney or a Microsoft or a Netflix, uh, going into those meetings, what we found the best approach is get to know the person on the other side of the table. And I'm not saying their personal life or stuff like that. Understand what their job responsibility is, what their, their biggest pain point or challenge is, how they perceive the world, what is of the most value to them. And this can be applied to anybody, a plumber, whoever, is we found that when you start that way, you gleam a lot of information mm. about how they perceive the world, how they perceive challenges, obstacles. And then you can go into the value of your service on how it pertains to solving that problem. Because the other way, and I've seen this with ourselves, I've seen this with other people, is if you start just with the pitch, mm -hmm. you may be talking about things that they don't care about. Yeah, or you may point. turn them off right away. So I've always found that you can really gleam a lot and, and, and hone in what you're going to present, that, uh, present to them by collecting information and data first. So I guess we'll pivot a little bit, but it kind of goes with that, what you've said there. How much does storytelling involved in making a successful quote unquote pitch. I know you, you, you're a fan and like him, likewise, am I of getting rid of the elevator pitch altogether, but, um, what, how storytelling, I, I love storytelling. I'm not a great storyteller. And that's one of the main reasons why I picked up your book. Um, but I, I, I want to hear what you have to say about storytelling and mastering the art of that and how that kind of goes into uh, the conversation you would have with like a Taylor Swift or, you know, MTV or, you know, a, a homeowner that uh, is needs their, their toilets replaced. Yeah. So there's different types of, of stories you can tell. Like when we talk about storytelling, most people think, oh, it's like a narrative. You're telling them like a children's bedtime story or like the Taylor of like a Taylor, like the Taylor Swift story that we just covered, which are effective. Mm -hmm. But you don't necessarily have to do it. Like if you're a plumber or, you know, some service-based business or like an electrician, yeah. do you really need to tell like stories about other clients? You can, it, it's effective, but the other form of a story is again, just how you, you, you take in this information of like, okay, this is what I'm, the client is experiencing the problems and challenges. And then you can just basically express this is how I'll overcome that challenge for you or help you with that challenge. And that is a story in and of itself of, it doesn't have to be like a, a narrative beginning, middle and an end. It could just be, okay, this is what you're presenting. This is, you know, what we're going to, you know, bring back the storytelling that I typically do is more case study driven. Like what I talked about with Taylor Swift, or if I go into another meeting, I'll, I'll talk about how I, worked with another client to achieve certain results. And I'll tell a story that way. 
But the most important thing that I have found is, is less about, you know, this, it's less about telling a story and more about how are you solving this person's greatest pain point? And, and, and the best way that, that, that I can um, describe this to everybody uh, listening or watching to this is just imagine that I come up to you on the street and I say, Hey, I know. And you think in your head, like, what is the thing that keeps you up at night? What causes you stress, anxiety? It could be personal. It could be professional, whatever. The thing that just really consciously is just driving you crazy, your biggest pain. And I come up to you on the street and say, Hey, listen, I know you're experiencing this pain. I would love to solve this for you. Mm. I mean, who's going to say no to that? We all want our our greatest problems and challenges solved. So that's exactly what you're doing in these meetings. Like if you're a plumber or electrician, maybe you're not solving their greatest problem, but you can figure out how the problem is impacting them or or any service uh, that your your, um, service or product or whatever you're selling can provide value to overcome that obstacle. Yeah, I love that. That is that is really good. I, I mean, and I love how you simplified it too, because I tend to over overcomplicate things. And so it's like, uh, you know, <clears throat> just come in, find out their pain point, have the conversation with them, and then go back to them and, and sh- just share with them how you're going to solve that pain point, how you're going to solve that that fear or that unknown the uncertainty and uh, with service businesses a lot of times people don't experience working with service businesses a lot so then the entire experience itself is unknown and so just having that clear uh story uh even built out i think would be a great a great idea for for any service business yeah i mean i just kind of break it down to I, I personally don't like selling. It just, I, I don't feel Same. comfortable doing it. Yeah. And so I, for myself, and I think the reason I'm able to operate at the level I am and close the clients I have is I don't go in and sell anything. I go in and solve problems. Yeah. I go in and I really understand, try to understand what is this person's greatest problem that is correlated, correlating to the service that I can provide. And then I just present the solution to that problem as our service. I'm not selling. I'm just saying this is one way you can approach it. And 98% of the time where we close a client, it's just because of that. And there's really very little conversation after that. You know, some cases like in the Taylor Swift's or the MTVs, there's drawn out negotiations and stuff, but typically like the deal closes in that initial conversation because you've built up enough uh, excitement that you're going to solve this big problem or challenge for them. So I feel like you're very similar to the, I, to myself and I don't like selling either. I like educating and, and, and creating that storyline, uh, like you said, but whenever it comes time to, to ask for the close or ask for the sale, like, how do you do that like how what in your experience for me that's kind of a struggle a lot of people that's that is their struggle even if they're especially if they quote unquote aren't salespeople. Um, so how do you do that so there's two approaches uh one approach is and i use i've used this a lot is uh when they say okay well what is the pricing or how do we go from here typically i don't like talking about pricing i don't feel comfortable so i say uh, I'll send you, I'll shoot you over an email that, you know, just here's the, you know, with the pricing and the structure and how it all works. Yeah. Um, cause what it does is take that, takes that pressure off of you. If you don't feel comfortable talking about pricing or you don't feel comfortable in negotiating right there on the spot, mm-hmm. some sales experts would probably advise against that. Right. Uh, but I kind of typically, uh, like doing that, uh, approach, it works better for me. And, uh, you know, with an electrician or a plumber, it's a bit different. I think you could just, you know, the pricing is not huge. Uh, mm-hmm. but the other, the other approach that we've employed more is, and this is when you start getting bigger or you create a partner is I don't, I have a sales team. I have a team that talks them through everything, closes the deal, the paperwork, collects the payment, everything like that. So I, I like to provide both options because in the beginning I wasn't big enough to have mm-hmm. a sales team. And I didn't really want to take on a partner and it wasn't, that I didn't want to take up on a partner. I just didn't have the right partner that I felt comfortable with. Right. Um, 
and scaling the business with from that respect. So uh, that's why I wanted to give two options is one is when you're just starting out, you can just play the email game with it. Uh, and number two, you can just get a partner, um, a VA or a salesperson to, to handle that part. If it's not something you feel comfortable with, or it's not something. Yeah, perfect. Cool. Uh, so we only have a few minutes left here. Would you mind sharing, uh, just the brief story for those who don't know, um, first, before I do that, what's the best way to get your book? I would go to, uh, the website book.hookpoint.com because there you can get the physical book, the ebook and the audio book all for, um, just the cost of, um, shipping the physical book. Oh, nice. That's perfect. Um, okay. So my last question, your experience, how you kind of became the social media guy, uh, tell your story about gaining the million followers and, and uh, how that happened and, and would you do it again type thing or would, is it doable again? Uh, well, it's definitely doable. Uh, we've done it many, many times. People look at the, the cover of the book and then they just assume they look at my social channels and they yeah. assume that that's all it is. Um, first off, we've, our team internally is amassed well over 50 million followers and wow. 40 billion views. So it's um, pretty extensive, but also people in the other people in the book that we feature uh, have amassed amazing things. It's not just me. It's not just our strategies. I went off and interviewed friends and partners that have done remarkable things on social media, like an influencer that did 15 million followers in 15 months, a friend that created a company that's doing three and a half billion views a month. Um, so there's a well-rounded perspective of different expertise uh, in that. So how did I get to it? Why did I do it? I did it because of everything we talked about. It was a hook point. So I had always been inspired by what Tim Ferriss did with the four, four hour work week as a book, as a ground pillar for a brand. And I had thought about doing a book for a long time, but again, because of my start in the entertainment industry, I was trained to think big. So if I'm going to do something like a book, I want to make sure that it has a strong hook to really grab people's attention and give it the best chance of success. Because it's something like there's over 1.7 million books released every year. Wow! It's, like, it's so noisy and crowded. Uh, so I had spent about three and a half years developing the methodologies that allowed me to do it. It wasn't like I just woke up one morning and did it. I created these systems through trial and error of working with big brands, celebrities, uh, journalists on how to scale their brand through different KPIs, whether it was views, um, shareability, clicks, traffic, uh, and then in some cases, followers. All of those objectives uses the same methodology. I just started getting asked to use it for followers, um, specifically with Facebook at the time. So I knew I could do it. It wasn't a matter of if I could do it, it was a matter of why I should do it. So I thought like, okay, I know I can generate a million followers in 30 days. Would it be interesting for me to do it for somebody that's a nobody, not a celebrity or, or a professional athlete or musician to start from scratch and just show what's possible? So what I did is I called up a literary agent uh, that I was connected with, uh, who's represented over $5 billion worth of book sales. So very well-versed in the market, very successful. And I just asked him, hey, I'm thinking about doing this experiment of generating a million followers in 30 days. And do you think that's a strong enough hook for a book? And I said, um, you know, would you sign me as a client and represent me and get me a publishing deal? And he said, yes. So I knew that was the first indication. So that's why I did it. Uh, you know, I did it uh, a million followers in hundred countries in 30 days on Facebook first. And then subsequently, I created a system for building a million followers on, on Instagram. Uh, but the whole motivation behind it was I knew that there was a lot of information that for myself and also my partners that I wanted to share with the world to help people get their message out there. But I knew that the only way to do it was to have a strong hook to bring people in to teach them what they need to know. So one of the principles, principles we talk about is there's a big difference between what people want and what people need. And oftentimes people fail in sales or, or, or scaling their business because they're focusing too much on the need that they know that the customer or the client has or, or needs to have, but the customer or client isn't there. So for example, I know that people need to know how to test content. 
I know they need to understand the psychology of communication to mm -hmm. successfully create content, the, the value and the importance of strategic partnerships, all of these things. But if I would have led with any of those, like if the book title was The Art of A-B Testing <laughs> right. on social media platforms, it would fall flat. So I start with the want of followers. Mm -hmm. So it's a million followers in 30 days of how I did it. And I said, and then I say, and I, it's in the book is like, okay, if you really want followers, then these are all the things you need to know how to master. And that's kind of how the progression of how that hook came about. Now, just a quick kind of um, background of how I accomplished this on Facebook and Instagram for, for ourselves and our, for our clients, Facebook we developed the system on top of the Facebook advertising platform, not using it as a media buying tool, but using it as a market research tool to identify content formats, themes, and structures uh, that are highly shareable. So I would just test all of these content. I would test like 300 content variations every night. Hmm. And I would um, wake up in the morning, look at the results, see what was being shared at the highest velocity and use those learnings to, to feel the next set of tests at midnight. And I would just do that over and over again to the tune of testing 5,000 variations of content in 30 days. Now, when I say 5,000 variations, it's not 5,000 individual pieces of content. I'll take one piece of content and test it 100, 200 different ways because it gives us more chances to win and more chances to learn. Um, so that's how we were able to scale uh, with Facebook. Instagram's different. It, the, the Facebook ad platform just doesn't work the same when it applies to Instagram, it does with Facebook. So we had to create a new testing methodology and process of distributing content on other high traffic and high follower account uh, accounts. So we have like one partner that has 5 million followers. Oh. So we'll test content variations organically through his account to see which drives the highest motivation of somebody clicking back and following uh, our account or our client's account. And then once we have that winning variation, then we have a network of 15 other accounts that we can syndicate that content out to. Huh. Well, that's cool. I love that. And that's all split. And that's all um, broken down in uh, the other book. Here. Yeah, it's, it, you know, Hookpoint actually has a lot of yeah. the testing methodologies in it is too. I would say for service-based businesses, Hookpoint is the best place to start. Yeah, I agree with that 100% because whenever service businesses aren't flashy, they're not, you know, it's not glamorous. And so for me, I've always had a struggle, like, what is my hook point? Like, how do I get a hook? And then I didn't use those exact questions and terms until I, I, I discovered your book. And then I was like, oh, yes, that's the question that I've been looking for, you know, how to answer that question. So yeah, that's, that's awesome. And I, I'm super. Yeah. And I just want to say that any service can be sexy. Any service can yeah. <laughs> take off online. Like we, we just worked with a dentist and repositioned her whole thing. Really? Um, there's a great YouTube channel called clear tax value and he's a tax accountant, but he's blowing up. He's at 1.2 million subscribers. Wow. And the average view rate is like three to 500,000 views. Um, there's a doctor called Dr. Mike that has, I, I don't even know what he's at right now, six or 7 million subscribers. So we really? often get that question asked is like, well, can this work? I know you worked with all these big celebrities and media companies, but can this work for me, my small business? Or, you know, I don't think my industry is sexy every industry can be contextualized with a hook point to grab attention. Sweet. Boom. Mic drop. Thank you. Where can people learn more about you, follow you, uh, and, and just learn more about hook point and everything that y'all do. Yeah. If people have interest, I would just check out hookpoint.com. Uh, if they want to connect with me, uh, they can direct message me on Instagram at Brendan Kane, uh, or they can check out my, my personal website, brendanjkane.com. Perfect, Brennan. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And thank you, everybody who's listening to or watching this episode of the Service Business Mastery Podcast. This is a podcast focused on service business owners, managers, and technicians who are considering becoming business owners themselves. I hope you found value in today's episode. My entire target with this show is to help answer some unasked questions. And a lot of times when we're first starting out, we don't even know to ask about anything like a hook point. But with that being said, I hope you have a wonderful and safe week. And until we talk again next time. Oh, 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 oh,